please. Well, the PowerPoint is coming up. First of all, uh, we would both like to thank, of course, the ICRC, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, with whom I've had the personal privilege of working in the past, and they're a really a truly wonderful foundation, and of course, uh, the Minerva Center of uh, this university. So thank you for having us. Um, and uh, we are here to present um, a research that we uh, started um, working on and um, following the use and the deployment by Israel of the Iron Dome during Operation Pillar of Defense in 2012. Uh, the reason why Israel deployed the Iron Dome uh, was to protect Israeli civilians from the constant and growing threat of uh, rocket attacks. And in fact, that was quite successful because the Iron Dome um, intercepted about 84 to 85% of Hamas rockets that would otherwise have fallen in civilian populated areas. Um, and those, so that's what prompted this effort to try to figure out what this means for international humanitarian law um, and, and, and building on the Israeli example. But make no mistake about it, this is not just about Israel. And uh, in fact, Israel is by no means the only country using defensive systems. And uh, I'm indebted to Ido for this example, but uh, we heard a few days ago that the United States just deployed the phalanx system, which is typically used to protect aircraft carriers and large ships at sea by the US. And the US has now be uh, begun using this system to protect US military personnel at a military base in eastern Afghanistan and to protect the personnel from the fire coming from the Taliban. Um, so this is this use of intel <coughs> what we call intelligence defense systems is said to become uh, under one form or another uh, a feature of contemporary warfare. And yet what we've realized in this research is that IHL has hardly devoted any attention to this question. And I don't want to say nothing has been written on it because then somebody will come up with the one piece that has been written on it. But truly, we haven't been able to find anything. And that is in terms of black letter law, pretty much, and as well as in terms of literature. So um, in fact, we even think that it has been left out of a very important debate about autonomous uh, weapon uh, systems. And uh, even um, in that context, uh, intelligence defense systems have hardly been mentioned, uh, if at all. Uh, but we'll get back to all of that in a minute, and I, and I think I want to say three preliminary things about this research. Uh, first of all, we're talking about the use of the Iron Dome during Operation Pillar of Defense, and of course, you'll tell me this is one operation. We have very limited data, so it's important to understand we're not doing here an empirical study, but rather we're trying to come up with some insights about, once again, what this means for uh, intelligence defense system, but also for IHL in general. Um, and the second thing is that this is very much a work in progress, so we are very, very looking forward to getting your s comments and reactions, which we anticipate to be um, quite um, uh, lively. And, um, and the second thing is because there is so little in terms of black letter law and in terms of literature on this issue, Basically, we're talking about a groundbreaking area uh, which we believe really needs to be explored further under, under humanitarian law. So let me just now tell you in a nutshell what we've discovered as part of this research. Uh, first of all, we argue that intelligent defense systems are not military objectives. And rather, we believe that they were purposefully taken out of the civilian military objective equation, not by us, but rather by international humanitarian law itself. And that instead of being regarded as military objective, uh, uh, an intelligent defense system should be regarded as civil defense. And we'll explain that in a minute. Uh, and the second thing we are going to do in this presentation is explain how the use and the deployment of intelligent defense systems reveals two fundamental flaws of international humanitarian law, and that's what we'll explore towards the end of our presentation. Uh, I'll now turn the floor to Eyal, who's going to explain to you uh, some of the main features of the Iron Dome. So I know a lot of my uh, Israeli colleagues are very familiar with the Iron Dome. Uh, a lot of my colleagues actually studied uh, during Operation Pillar of Defense, and we were hearing it from our classrooms. Uh, that being said, I'm just going to quickly go over a little background information for those of us who are from European countries and uh, the United States. So Israel began initial planning surrounding the Iron Dome in 2005, but ramped up development following the Second Lebanon War in 2006, where close to 4,000 rockets killed over 40 Israeli civilians. Uh, the Iron Dome is one of several intelligent defensive systems located in Israel. 
Uh, both the Iron Dome and Patriot missile system are currently operational. David's Sling, which is also known as Magic Wand, is currently in the later stages of development. The most important characteristics of these systems, which I may occasionally call IDSs for short, are that they are defensive and non-lethal in nature. These systems serve to provide a dome of protection for populated areas. They have also been employed, as Daphne referenced, uh, to, pro to protect objects within certain theaters of operation. As the name implies, intelligent defense systems have the ability not only to identify and track incoming projectile threats, but also to discriminate, prioritize, and destroy them based on a program threat level. The Iron Dome exemplifies this intelligence, which is really defined here as the ability to pick and choose which incoming projectiles it wishes to intercept, as well as decide whether, where they will be intercepted. Now, for example, only incoming projectiles will have a trajectory threatening a, a populated area will actually be intercepted. Furthermore, these projectiles will be intercepted in areas which are unpopulated, which greatly reduces the possibility of damage to civilian objectives. And this is a major difference between the Iron Dome and some of the earlier models of the Patriot missile system. Now you may be thinking, how can the Iron Dome do all of this successfully? And the answer is autonomy. Uh, however, this is certainly not the rogue autonomous robot that Human Rights Watch predicts will produce the unethical and unlawful warfare. Uh, the Iron Dome is strictly defensive in nature and is actually used to prevent the realistic nightmares associated with the indiscriminate rocket fire. This is only possible because the multifaceted system is constantly monitoring variables and making calculations required to achieve its unique humanitarian services that are simply impossible to do at human speeds given the characteristics of its target. So though the Iron Dome is currently employed to provide humans the potential to override its targeting decisions, it is not clear to what extent this capability is being used or whether a situation would ever dictate it useful. Despite this questionable human interaction, the Iron Dome is designed and could conceivably be deployed in an autonomous fashion, which Human Rights Watch would consider human out of the loop. Thank you. So here's the question, right? Is this a military objective? And why should we care about that question at all? What is under IHL the legal status of a defensive system? And let's take an, we are going to take an example to, to try to analyze this a little bit further, once again using the Iron Dome. Uh, the kind of situation that we're looking at now is a situation where the enemy, uh, whose fire we're trying to intercept through the use or via the use of the Iron Dome, that enemy is actually seeking to target the battery itself, the Iron Dome battery itself. And so the, uh, there is incoming fire, there's an attack against the Iron Dome battery, which is the objective, and the battery is located in a civilian or civilian populated area. So let's think about what that would mean, what would be the implications of regarding the Iron Dome battery in this particular example as a military uh, objective. And we're going to try to do that without using um, our apparently much loved Article 52, which is in the background, but we are trying to think about this from the pr practical standpoint here. So what would be the, uh, the implications? Um, first of all, the fact that the uh, Iron Dome battery is located in a civilian populated area could potentially uh, mean that the user of the battery uh, would be violating the obligation to take necessary precautions to protect its civilians under Article 58 of AP1. So that's the first uh, possibility. Another possibility would be that this piece of machinery, once again located in a civilian area, would be used, uh, uh, again, allegedly, in order to render military objectives, the Iron Dome, immune from military operation under this uh, rationale. Finally, and this is uh, also very disturbing, then the enemy could potentially be able to justify uh, collateral damage uh, against either those, uh, sorry, not those operating the Iron Dome, but those living in the vicinity of it in that civilian populated area, which is uh, collateral damage that would otherwise have been considered uh, unlawful. And I think perhaps most importantly, um, if we treat this Iron Dome battery as a military objective, what we're doing is that we're undermining the system's humanitarian purpose. Uh, why was the system placed in that civilian area in the first place? Well, it was placed there in order to protect the civilians from indiscriminate attacks. And by uh, upholding this idea of military objective, we're essentially uh, ignoring uh, or undermining this, this aspect of the, of the picture. Now, let's think, let's think about what would happen if we don't consider the Iron Dome as a military objective. Well, any forthcoming death resulting from the 
targeting of the Iron Dome battery, meaning its incapacita incapacitation or its destruction, would actually consider, uh, constitute violations of IHL because this wouldn't be a legitimate target. And um, again, perhaps most importantly, uh, we would be upholding IHL's core values, which it are the values that prompted the development of the Iron Dome uh, in the first place. So will a strike against an Iron Dome battery be considered lawful, yes or no? And here, basically, the, the arguments that we have in favor and against uh, regarding this piece of technology as a military objective um, reflect the inherent tension not only behind intelligent defense systems, but also at the heart of IHL itself. And that's why we think this example embodies much of the, um, the, the tensions that we encounter in IHL in general. It, it epitomizes them in a way. So on one hand, and this is looking at it from the perspective of the enemy, of course, destroying or incapacitating this piece of machinery, this Iron Dome battery, would provide the enemy with a military advantage, right? Because then all of its rockets would actually be able to reach their target. So, and that's where our legal intuition is really pushing us very, very, very strongly in that direction. Uh, and we need to resist it. Um, so the second, uh, and the second aspect which seems to argue, once again, in favor of, of the military objective uh, qualification is that it could be, and this is the case with the United States example that I gave earlier, that this se very same Iron Dome battery could maybe be used in order to protect military objectives, military bases, military personnel, or, and perhaps uh, in a grayer kind of area, used to protect both, both, civilian, uh, uh, both civilians and civilian objects and combatants and military uh, uh, objects. Um, but if we go with our legal intuition, which, and I admit it, seems to strongly advocate a qualification as a military objective, we are completely ignoring the other part of the story. And whereby we are undermining, this is our argument, international humanitarian law itself. Once again, the purpose of this machinery is to protect the civilian population. But perhaps most importantly, it is there to correct the commission of war crimes by the other side. It is correcting IHL non-compliance. Uh, it is preventing these war crimes from actually materializing. The target won't be able to reach, uh, sorry, the rocket won't be able to reach its civilian target. Um, and so uh, this is basically the kind of tensions that we face because of the unique feature of these intelligent defense systems. And we seemingly are in an unresolvable uh, deadlock. Um, so here's what we suggest. Rather than trying to fit intelligent defense systems in these uh, in this traditional and seemingly, we would argue, ill-suited di di dichotomy between civilian and military objectives, we would suggest an alternative approach. So I know Professor Schmidt brought up uh, special protection in the last panel. Obviously, I don't think he was re referring to the Iron Dome, but uh, we'll continue along those lines. We believe that the solution to the conceptualization problem surrounding the Iron Dome actually lies in civil defense which is a topic that's been largely neglected by legal scholars. There's been virtually no contemporary scholarship regarding the meaning or operational value of civil defense. Now, I'll refer to uh, Robert Geis' presentation last night, uh, Robin Geis', excuse me, I hope, Robin, that this uh, civil defense application of IHL provides a potential solution for certain objectives serving a critical humanitarian function that simply don't logically, from both an operational and theoretical sense, qualify as a dual-use system. Now, the roots of the very concept of civil defense can be found in Article 63 of the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949. <coughs> it was included primarily to enable the ICRC and other groups concerned with upholding humanitarian services to operate safely in situations of occupation. However, the ICRC specifically felt it was critical to take civil defense a step further. Twenty years of lobbying and hard-fought preparation resulted in convincing the world that special protection status was needed for all those engaged in the protection of civil populations during armed conflict. This led to the creation of Articles 61 through 67 of AP1. The status of IHL provides civil defense is of the same legal nature as the immunity of medical and health services. It is also similar to that of cultural property under spe special protection. So what are the tasks that are given the special protected status? Under Article 61, you will see 14 tasks as well as a 15th indicating complementary activities necessary to carry out 
any tasks mentioned. These tasks, like so much of IHL, reflect an imperfect compromise between the principle of humanity and military necessity. Simply put, the Iron Dome embodies civil defense, defense's essential purpose, which is providing assistance to the preservation of objects essential to survival. Returning to the tasks specifically mentioned in Article 61, the Iron Dome is essentially a technologically operated shelter. The difference is only in the nature of how this protection is being provided. Let's take this logic to the extreme. Now, if the Iron Dome was 100% successful in its inter interceptions, civil defense tasks such as shelters, <coughs> warnings, evacuations, etc., contemplated in Article 61 might become altogether obsolete. Too good to be true? Illogical? We don't think so. Articles 61 through 67 are sufficiently and purposefully broad enough to protect the individual and often unique needs specific to a country. We do, however, want to address certain problems that might be imagined. First of all, can the Iron Dome both acquire and maintain protected civil defense status if it is protecting military objectives? The answer is yes. It is especially at the moment when a mission is assigned that it should be determined whether this mission does or does not fall under the definition of civil defense. A great example of this is an air raid siren. Now, an appropriately placed air raid siren would help alert as many civilians as possible to get cover. However, it is absolutely conceivable that the same siren may also warn proximate targetable military personnel, thus also providing a military advantage. In this situation, IHL still provides protection to civil defense system. The leniency was given to civil defense tasks because in doing so, it best protects what IHL considers this crucial function. What about the fact that the Iron Dome is operated by the military? Can the Iron Dome acquire civil defense status under these circumstances? The answer again to this objection is unequivocally yes. Article 67 is devoted exclusively to this. Daphne and I know this is counterintuitive. We agree that cha this challenges some of the very basic <coughs> explanations we've grown accustomed to regarding the dichotomy between military objectives and civilian objectives. However, IHL has, in the case of civil defense, provided a way to advance humanitarian values without even making it a requirement. We hope that our continued exploration of, of how civil defenses could and should be applied to the Iron Dome, that more states, practitioners, and scholars look to the unloved yet critical alternative categorization hiding within IHL itself. Okay, so um, beyond the question of conceptualization, um, the use and the development of interna inter intelligent defense system reveals two very important features of international humanitarian law as a corpus of norms designed to regulate the conduct of states uh, during war. And these features um, demonstrate, yet again, other ways in which IHL is struggling to adapt to the realities of the modern battlefield, and we'd like to expose these in, uh, very briefly. So simply put, the Iron Dome is designed to uphold IHL's core values and remedy violations committed by enemy belligerents. It also, and paradoxically, embodies its employer's acknowledgement that IHL has failed to normalize enemy behavior in asymmetric warfare. Having failed to normalize enemy behavior, IHL cannot but encourage the use of the Iron Dome to protect civilians, but at the same time, by encouraging the use of defensive systems, IHL implicitly abdicates, for, excuse me, implicitly abdicates responsibility for the non-compliant behavior of these systems, <coughs> of these actors, and fails to discourage non-compliant behavior in the future. We believe either policy results in conflict escalation, increased non-compliance, and the delegitimization of IHL. We have coined this an asymmetric escalation paradox. Despite the depressing conclusion of our paradox, IHL has no choice but to relate to the Iron Dome. Providing the Iron Dome with a, civil, a civilian objective status would incentivize its use. However, it is also likely to increase Hamas rocket fire. For example, Hamas launched six and a half times as many indiscriminate rockets per day during Operation Pillar of Defense than it did during Operation Castlet just four years earlier. It may have also encouraged Hamas to develop and indiscriminately launch rockets with greater range and payload. Now, this is clearly conflict escalation in the sense that despite the Iron Dome's 85% interception rate, on average, more rockets were landing in Israel per day during the last conflict in a much larger area. On the other hand, declaring the Iron Dome a military objective would disincentivize the Iron Dome. Intelligent defensive systems are very costly to develop, deploy, as well as maintain. If they can be easily targeted, this may lead to state abandonment of their development, their purchase, and even their use. 
and even more severely prohibiting its use vis-a-vis -vis proposed autonomous weapon bans by certain scholars and NGOs may force Israel to engage Palestinians in a more direct, offensive, and intense manner. If this led to the Iron Dome's absence from conflict, it will likely result in greater enemy combatant and enemy civilian casualties. Furthermore, and more probably, Israel would likely deploy the Iron Dome anyway, which also potentially diminishes IHL compliance. Okay, um, we're almost up with time, and um, I just want to highlight one more thing that this research has revealed. Um, and um, perhaps you would think this is, um, it was to be expected that IHL would focus on developing causative obligations for states. Most of IHL and, um, and Ruvi, where is Ruvi? Ruvi alluded to this earlier this morning when he said that most of IHL actually tells states how they can, how they have to behave vis-a-vis -vis belligerents, how they to behave vis-a-vis -vis the belligerents combatants who are legitimate targets, and how they to behave vis-a-vis -vis the belligerents civilians who should be protected from attack. And so most of IHL focuses on that. There are a few norms here and there, but you can count them on half of a, one hand. And um, those norms um, have not been explored, interpreted, debated nearly as much as what we call the causative norms of IHL. And so um, whereas IHL focuses on the opponents, uh, on the treatment of the opponent civilian and combatants, what the use and the deployment of IDS, intelligent defense system, shows us is that there is actually a need, particularly when we're dealing in asymmetric warfare in a situation where reciprocity has broken down, where the onus is now on the law-abiding party to actually find ways to protect its own civilians from attack, to actually determine or to come up with greater, more comprehensive regulation on what we call reflexive obligations, meaning how a state ought to behave vis-a-vis -vis its own civilians and its own combatants. So even though it has never been framed in, in these terms, you're very familiar with this issue in the context of combatants. And we've discussed it in these very walls when we talked about the proportionality calculus. To what extent can state take into account the harm caused to their own combatants when deciding whether or not to carry out an attack? Uh, we've never attributed that to the lack of reflexive uh, a regime or reflexive obligations under IHL, but we believe that it stems from the same problem. And so now, when we're looking at it from the point of view of the civilians, um, we, this problem is exemplified by the uh, intelligent defense systems. So let's think about it for a second. Can a civilian come and claim that the state is under an obligation to protect it using an Iron Dome battery if such a battery is actually available? What is the extent of the state's obligation vis-a-vis -vis its civilians? What can the civilians actually demand? And believe it or not, there were Israeli civilians who turned to the Supreme Court here in Israel and requested from the court to say that the state was under an obligation to place an Iron Dome battery where they lived in order to protect them. So the court said, of course, the state is not under such an obligation. And I think part of the reason why these reflexive aspects of IHA were left out is because it was viewed that this would be a matter for states to figure out on their own and it was a matter for domestic policy. But contemporary warfare is teaching us, slowly but surely, that these aspects can no longer remain on the fringe of IHL, but rather deserve our full attention. Um, so we need to construct comprehensive, reflexive obligations under IHL to complement the ones that were expanded as causative obligations. So um, this brings us to our conclusion. And, um, I think we can all agree that given the breadth of the issues that uh, these kind of systems raise, it is very surprising that there was not more attention devoted to them. And what we're trying to do is initiate a debate, uh, initiate a debate on the legal and the policy issues that arise out of the use and the, develop and the deployment of intelligence defense systems. We want to challenge, challenge your legal intuition. At first sight, this looks like just another challenge to the established category of civilian and military objective. And yet, when we look at it further, we realize that IHL has actually taken out uh, from this equation um, civil defense purposefully, and theref therefore all the considerations that are relevant to the qualification as a military objective would no longer be relevant when we're talking about civil defense. Um, if we can say just one thing to the ICRC, perhaps. Uh, first of all, we welcome your comments, but we would like to ask the ICRC, after spending 20 years to convince the world that civil defense was such an important part of IHL, perhaps it is time to revive it and spend some time thinking about what states are doing to, uh, for civil defense and how we can encourage states to actually do this even more. Thank you very much for your attention.